Eve. So now I'll let Susan introduce her to the other half. Hello, everybody. I'm Susan Crawford. I'm a visiting professor at the Kennedy School and the Law School uh, with a very strong interest in internet policy and open government. And uh, my half of the class is going to be studying open gov, basically. Um, and also, I'm thrilled that we're meeting here and that we now have such an enriched lab for all of you. Uh, I also want to introduce Diane Chang, who's here. Hello. Everybody get to know Diane. She's the course assistant for everybody for the entire community innovation lab. And Kate Balug. Hi, I'm Kate Balug. I'm here uh, coming from the mayor's office of New York Mechanics from Boston. I did go to the GSD study with Mike. I just finished in 2011, so I understand the GSD processes pretty well. Uh, very excited to be here, and uh, my work with the Urban Mechanics will be helping you guys, helping facilitate this class, as well as implementing some of the projects that the same version of Diane's class uh, did last semester with Susan. So if I can help answer any of those questions as that's happening also. It's very excited to be here. And I also want to introduce uh, one of our uh, partners in this class, who is Jason Webb from the Dennis Creek Neighborhood Initiative. There he is. And he was, uh, last term when we did this class, DS and I was, was our partner. And I'm so grateful to Jason for uh, being willing to repeat this adventure again. Right. So this is Jason. Looking forward to working with everyone. That's great. But Mike, Mike's going to kick things off. Wonderful. So we wanted to start by giving an overview of the logistics of the class and basic, giving you a basic sense of why this lab exists. So, without further ado, uh, the reason we've not. got you all in this circle, uh, particularly this class, is that second hour, Marshall Gans is going to be here talking to us. Uh, a, a wonderful person to talk to us about working in, in the neighborhood and with people. Yeah, this is huge. I don't know how many people are familiar with Marshall Gans. Oh. Brilliant. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us. He basically is going to speak to you about you know, how do you actually engage. Obviously, it's going to be a whirlwind tour, but how do you engage with communities? Um, and then later on, we're going to have a little bit more of an advanced workshop with Marshall's team on how to um, engage more deeply. So we're going to get this sort of introduction today and then a more deep um, uh, study in community engagement and organizing with Marshall. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. And that's really exciting because some of you may have tried to take his classes, and as you know, he's a very hot commodity on campus. So the fact that we've been able to snag just a little bit of his time is huge. And that's partially because he's really um, intrigued, I think, by the idea of this class, which is a bit different from a lot of courses either at the KSG, sorry, I use the old acronym, HKS, <laughs> or GSD. Um, but that's OK. Don't worry about my acronym mistakes, because most people think the GSD is the school of divinity, so that's all right. <laughs> so as you probably have already gleaned by now, there's two seminar tracks associated with this course. For those of you uh, coming who have just been with uh, Susan, you've been in GPI 682. For those of you who were with me this morning, you've been in GSD 5468. The, the foci of these two seminars is slightly different. The group who's studying at the GSD are looking at participatory planning and design. The group who have been here for the last hour are looking, as you know, at the application of tech to solving community problems. So different focuses for those two groups, but then coming together into this shared community innovation lab from four to six. So it's a pretty novel structure, but I think a really exciting one because it brings together students with really diverse interests, which you know, as a proxy for the real world, usually architects don't just work with architects, planners with planners, policymakers with policymakers. The truth is, you work in interdisciplinary teams. So that's exactly what you're going to be doing over the coming term. So what is going to actually happen this term? Well, students are going to learn about a particular neighborhood. Dudley Square area, Dudley more broadly, Roxbury neighborhood. You're going to be working with three communities, community organizations, in this area. So you're going to learn a tremendous amount about the community groups working there and this physical space. And you're going to work with these communities in real life situations, grappling with real life challenges. And you're going to iteratively develop collaborative projects over the term that try to address some fundamental concern of our community partners. Again, you're going to do that in these interdisciplinary teams. And in the course of doing that, you're going to see how the knowledge that you gather through those two seminar tracks can actually be applied. A lot of that knowledge might be a little bit abstract, how it can actually be applied 
in real life scenarios, sort of where the rubber hits the road. So we have sort of a slightly more eye track component, the seminars, and then this very real life element. So you're, again, you're going to engage very closely with a bunch of different partners. Uh, a core institutional partner, you've just met Kate, the mayor's office for New Urban Mechanics, and three incredibly dynamic community organizations who are going to be your partners in this enterprise, but you're going to be their partners. Slight difference, but an important one. Um, and you're going to collaborate with these partners and your peers to develop innovations, plans, and prototypes, again, that can tackle some sort of core challenge that they face. And hopefully, that innovation, that prototype that you develop by the end of term, is going to be elegant enough and cheap enough and suitable enough that it can be delivered, it can actually be implemented. So we're looking at things that have the capacity for implementation. And that's why our association with the Mayor's Office of New Urban, Mechan Urban Mechanics is huge, because they're going to provide some tangible resources of a couple of types, not the least of which is the institutional continuity that Kate's going to provide once the term is over, giving a, a life to these projects beyond the class. So I think as I mentioned in the talk we gave to the, at KSG uh, in the intro to the class last week, you know, a lot of projects just at the end of term, they go on your C drive. They've been a great experience, but that's the end. The hope here is that these projects can see the light of day be implemented um, and live, again, beyond the hard drive of your computer. So this is just a brief, very brief overview. As you know, the instructors, Susan, myself, teaching assistant, Diane, all of this information is contained in the um, syllabus. Do you want to quickly, since we have some newcomers? Yes. All right. <laughs> all right. Hi, Not guys. to put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm Chris Osgood. I coach out in there as office. I'm Michael Jacob. I'm the other co-chair of Cooper Games. So this is, this is huge because, <laughs> this is because despite what we look like. <laughs> white shirts and black suits. Well, you see, they, they actually thought they were going to the Burger King presentation. <laughs> 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 and remember, growth is everything. Um, part of the mantra of this is that, part of the mantra of this class is that maybe it's not. It could be, but maybe not. Um, so the, the, what the mayor's office in urban mechanics brings is this incredible uh, innovation in city government. So many of you may have worked with city governments in the past or been exposed to city government. Um, what I love about this office is it's sort of everything sometimes that you maybe think city government isn't. This is like some of the most creative, uh, ingenious people working in city government in the United States. Uh, you hear their name brought up when you talk to other city governments about how do you do something interesting? Well, maybe you should try to emulate these folks. So this is really, really exciting. Um, and I think just the fact that they've actually come here, I mean, this is all also incredibly outside the box. <laughs> you might get city officials to come and critique your work at the end, but the idea that they're going to work with us and the community partners to actually develop the project is, quite frankly, exceptional and pretty damn exciting from my perspective. Incredibly important to this whole process, really at the heart of this whole process, are three community partner organizations. Now, Kate, Jason, others are going to say something about these, um, but just to introduce them, we have the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is with, with which Jason is associated, the Orchard Garden Residents Association, a public housing uh, tenants association, and the Upham's Corner Main Streets Initiative, which is an uh, association of businesses, small businesses and entrepreneurs. So three very different organizations working in the same general area, all with incredible strengths, incredible resources, and some serious challenges that we're going to learn about over the coming term. Incredibly exciting. So I won't give away uh, the punchline on our organizations at this point, just to say that they're really exciting. So just to give you a whirlwind tour of the approach of the lab, we're basically going to progress in a series of exercises from learning in the abstract about this community in this physical space to learn, working with the people who actually occupy that space, finally to developing ideas with them and then refining and honing those ideas, and finally getting to something that has the capacity to actually be implemented and hopefully make a real difference. So it's this sort of iterative process, focusing in, working broadly at first, and then honing down. The de specific design, you might be wondering, especially if you're from the GSD, hey, where's the design brief? So just to put it out front, the specific design briefs that you'll be given 
are actually going to emerge from your relationship with your community partner, and of course your strengths, <coughs> passions, interests, and skills. So there's these broad topics that the communities have identified that are of interest to them. But in terms of the specific design brief, you know, the parameters of the thing you're going to be working on, that's really going to be a thing that emerges from that very personal relationship that you'll develop with your community partner. So it's to come, and it's going to grow out and be very unique to your relationship, both with the space and the people that you meet and work with. Again, a little bit outside the box, and just to warn you, if you love working alone or maybe with like-minded people, this, this is probably going to be a bit of a change. Naturally, there's going to be some people in this room coming from Susan's class who digital tech is their life. And there's probably going to be someone from the GSD class who just, they're an architect and they love architecture, they love physical structures. And there's going to be a lot of people in between those two poles. And the great thing is your teams are going to include a lot of those assets, interests, and skills. And so, again, that's going to inform the direction you ultimately go. And you're going to be working collaboratively with your peers to figure out where your strengths are. Uh, who can do what? Who wants to get out of their comfort zone the most? Who's a little bit more cautious, etc. So, again, it's going to be a very personal relationship in these interdisciplinary teams. So we've said that there's a focus on technology. Obviously, one of the courses that feed into this lab has a direct, direct focus on technology. Um, and broadly, this lab also does. And in that sense, we're defining technology very broadly, maybe very traditionally in a way, as the application of science, art, and craft to the improvement of life. So, Actually, what is defined as technology is constantly being iterated and is open to redefinition based on, quite frankly, how applicable these tools and methods are to the improvement of livelihoods. So this area of what constitutes technology is constantly being redefined. You're going to be part of that process. So at the moment, it's hard to say what actual technology or what facet of technology you're actually going to be dealing with, because again, it's going to come out of your relationship with the community. Um, but Suffice it to say, the definition of technology we're using is very broad. You get to be part of the definition of what it, actually, what it will actually be for you. So again, just to give you a quick sense, if you look in the syllabus, you'll see how each of these weeks, these sessions play out. But effectively, you're working from the introduction today to understanding Dudley as a very broad area, a physical space, and then honing in, interacting very closely with your community partners, understanding their strengths, assets, needs, Developing, looking at precedents, for example. Developing three ideas with your community partners that seem to have some sort of traction. Honing those three ideas, choosing one that seems the most workable, the most elegant, the most useful. Recalibrating with partners, other groups that might be able to assist, funders, uh, other people who have a sense of how these things work in other contexts, for example. And finally, presenting both publicly and to your community partners, this idea. So basically, in terms of sort of a macro structure, you're basically working from sort of a broad scoping of issues down to this narrow refining of your innovation um, that's been developed with the community you're working with. So just to give you a broad sense of the overview, broad sense of I'm actually going to leave the maps for Kate. I know she has better maps. Um, <laughs> But just, and I know if you happen to get a chance to read the Streets of Hope chapter, you have a broad sense of where we're talking about and a lot of the issues the community is facing. Incredibly exciting community. Importantly, one that Harvard students don't get to enough. Often, as I was saying this morning, you know, Somerville's a long way away. Um, and more the shame for it. So I think this is going to be a really exciting opportunity to learn about Boston as a complete city um, and really get a sense of what's going on in a part of the city that you might otherwise not go to. I think you're going to find it a really enriching experience. So I'll leave the maps for Kate. A um, couple of logistical notes, informations, information, readings, activities are described in the Community Innovation Lab schedule, which is separate from the two seminar schedules. You've already been given a copy. And all pertinent information is also posted on the Tumblr site. Uh, Dan will probably have more about Deadly that. Actually, I'll write it on the Please, board. yeah. Yep. Dudleyclass.tumblr.com. And you can always email me if you're somehow not able to find information. I'll be glad to forward it on. So maybe on that note, I should, uh, we ha also have some information on the assignment for next week, but we can leave that for now. And maybe we can turn over the table to some other folks who have a few words of introduction for you. Yeah, well, we
since we always start with people, this, uh, this course is about working with people, and we're privileged to have uh, some really gifted people uh, to talk to. So I want to ask um, Jason, I really want to talk to the class. Yeah, so uh, here's Jason who does the two neighborhood initiative. And I, I don't think I can say, just introducing Jason a little bit more, how <laughs> awesome these community groups yeah. are and the people <laughs> that we get the opportunity to collaborate with. It's a, it's a huge, huge opportunity for us. So thanks a lot, Jason. Oh, not a problem. Um, and it's also a privilege for us as a community, as an organization, to continue to work with folks um, time and time again. So last year, we were, you know, the sole community group. We were like the guinea pig. <laughs> Hoped and pride. And, you know, and now we're back for more. Uh, because what we got out of it was great. So, um, as a way of introduction, my name is Jason Webb. I'm the Director of Administration and Finance for Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, I grew up in Dudley. Um, I'm actually a resident there of 32 years. Been with the organization for 25 years. So, grew up in the organization, grew up in the community. As you guys read parts of Streets of Hope, you know, a lot of the challenges that we faced 28 years ago are real. And some of them are still real today in terms of our community. So we continue to struggle as a community even though we've gone 28 years forward and we have ama amazing accomplishments, but there's still a lot of struggles. There's still a lot of challenges. We will challenge groups such as yours to come up with innovative ideas that we've not thought of and that we have not come up with. So, but I also want to send an invitation to you guys. This Friday and Saturday, we're actually holding a conference. It's actually our first conference that we've ever had. It's called Growing Community Development Without Displacement. And I'll pass this around to everybody. I think I made enough. And this conference here is it's really nine workshops that we have developed over the years. Some of them has to deal with how we actually have revitalized our community. And one of the things that I'll offer to us, because you guys are partners, is actually free registration to the conference. So it, it may be a great way of, if you see a workshop and you're like, oh yeah, I really want to know more about that issue, it may actually help you with your next class assignment. Um, then please go on to the Eventbrite, register, and where it says pay now, just say other payment options. And say pay by invoice, pay at the door. As long as I have your email address, then I'll know to comp, comp the registration. So but that's all that I have for now, because I know on the Tumblr site, because I was on there recently, a bunch of information about the organization and about what, what we've done. So I want to thank everybody for, again, the opportunity for us to work together again. It's great. Vintage is uh, when Miramino won his fifth term. Uh, so he's been in office now 20, About 20, years. 20 years. And the challenge for uh, I think a long city mayor is really upon re election, you know, what new do you have to say? And so he's done a lot of interesting things. And one of, one of his responses to that question was to say that what we, one of the things that we need is a sustainable way uh, of innovating within city government. And so one of the, the sort of the, the cornerstone of that um, uh, way of thinking 
is, has been to establish this office of new urban mechanics. So Chris and I are the co-chairs. We have patterned his operation very much in terms of uh, as an incubator. So we have a board of governors, uh, which is essentially the mayor, our chief of staff, and the city's chief information officer. And the two of us as co-chairs, essentially with the managing directors. And then we have a series of program managers, people that sort of own specific um, clusters of work, of which Kate is one of those. Um, you know, we have been calling ourselves a civic innovation incubator. Um, and I, I recently I started describing ourselves as a civic innovation collaboratory <laughs> because the, I think people responded to that, so I think that's what we're going to do. Um, we have a huge range of things that we engage in. So the, the, the basic way that this works is that we, we understand, and there, there just is just a handful of us now, um, and a city like Boston obviously has incredible resources um, at the community level. There's, there's universities, there's community groups like Jason's, there's private individuals, for-profit companies, uh, nonprofits, and so on. And the challenge for us is not so much how do we do things internally to city government that will be innovative, but rather how do we stitch together these different communities into these networks that are doing really interesting things. And so all of the work that we do is, is comes out of this collaboration across uh, verticals, uh, across these different sectors. And so as a result of that, we do projects that are on the one hand, um, oftentimes technology flavored, uh, but we're certainly not technologists in that sense, right? So we, we think about technology again, sort of as Mike was saying, in the most general sense. And so we also do focus a lot on, on design, um, on sort of partnering with local, local design firms or sort of global design firms also, uh, in terms of trying specific interventions within communities to sort of change the way that people relate to the built infrastructure and think about the interrelate or relate to the city and so on. So a lot of different things in there. And our work with universities falls somewhere in between. People, um, university researchers, faculty that are looking to to get more deeply engaged with communities and solving real world problems and sort of having a lasting impact um, at the community level. So that's sort of the, uh, the four minute spiel of new mechanics. I would add one, one yeah. small thing before turning over to Kate. So as Michael and Susan referenced, there are tons of cities that are out there right now that are, that are doing urban innovation in some form or other. Our specific sort of brand of it is one that is really built around the idea of uh, the notion that a city really will work for everybody when it is built by everybody. That is a terrible uh, plagiarism of a Jane Jacobs quote, but that is this idea, this idea that if, if Boston is really sort of co-created by all of our residents, by all of our institutions, we actually will be a city that works for all of those residents and all of those players. And this class is really about exactly that. It is about collaborating with neighborhood organizations, with fellow students, with the city government itself, to figure out how do we actually do stuff that is new and better, that solves, that takes new approaches to solving long and enduring challenges that our city has been facing. Um, and so I, I, I welcome and I'm really excited by all the folks that are here. Um, as you enter these projects, bring yourself. Like we really want your imagination and your creativity. Uh, we had an awesome class uh, last spring and what made it terrific was the moment when all the students started uh, to really sort of push themselves to think about what could they do that would be really new and really different and really imaginative. And we've got some crazy ideas, a whole bunch of which we're actually uh, doing with Jason and Kate now. Um, and so I'm really excited for, for this class and for what we can actually build and create together. So I'll introduce the really briefly the three community partners. So can we get the, the map? So as you already met Jason, we had worked with Jason last semester and knew that we would be continuing to work with him. So DSNI, the organization that Jason works with, is a large community organizing planning body uh, within the Dudley Street area. <laughs> They've been around since 1984. They're a very powerful, exciting, dynamic group in the neighborhood that does a lot of different kinds of development and, and growth, and from education to physical development to cultural development um, to community organizing. So there, the flag right in the middle of the map is where they are. Um, do, does anyone know where that is in Boston? We need to zoom out for a second so you get a sense. Zoom, zoom the wrong way. So here we go. And where? So we're we're here. There you go. So so as you see, this I don't. How many of you have been to the Dudley neighborhood before? Okay, so you more or less a lot of you know where that is. So we knew that uh, DS and I would be in the middle, and we were interested in kind of if we zoom back in. 
uh, working along Dudley Street and finding groups to kind of expand into the neighborhood and touch upon both Roxbury and Dorchester. So the, the group on the bottom, the second flag there, is actually Upham's Corner. The Upham's Corner Main Street, which is part of the Main Street initiative that is, exists all throughout Boston. I think there are 16 of them, one per neighborhood. And they help local businesses, they help spur local economic development, they help start new businesses, educate small business owners about uh, opportunities available to them. So Upham's Corner is a very interesting area. It's primarily uh, Cape Verdean, but there's a lot of economic disparity in the area. They have a lot of really interesting issues that they're excited for students to work on, and the person uh, who will be working with there is Max uh, McCarthy, who is the executive director of that organization. So they uh, primarily work with volunteers. He's a staff member of one. So <laughs> for the group that works with him, we'll have to be very conscious of his time, but he also has a whole uh, great uh, board member task force that's very active and engaged with his activities, and as well as a lot of community members. So I think that'll be a really fun one. And then we have DSNI, which you've already heard about. They also have a lot of super interesting projects up their sleeves, and they've already been through the process, so they know how to, how to engage the students in a really great way. Um, and then the last one up north is the close to Dudley Square itself. It's the third flag there, right by Orchard Park, is the Orchard Gardens Residence Association. Orchard Gardens was a Hope 6 project that was redeveloped in the early uh, 2000s, late 90s, uh, through the mobilization of the local residence association. So this was a largely abandoned, very kind of troubled housing site. And uh, one of the, the sister, actually, of one of our two main partners, who's now the head of the board, uh, was the person that mobilized residents and, and got the process uh, begun to, to start this three-phase development that is mixed income, has drastically improved the neighborhood, um, and it's very small, but, but has a lot of really interesting issues, too. So we were aware in looking at these, at these neighborhoods that you guys will have a lot of different interests coming from the design school, coming from the uh, government school, and we wanted to give you kind of a broad range of projects to work on. So each of these nine uh, project areas are very different, very broad, but we hope will be super interesting to, uh, to all of you. So that's, that's really it. This map is available on your class website so that uh, you can kind of get a sense of the area. And the, the other things on the map are other organizations that I thought might be useful for you to kind of be aware of as once you start designing and working on your project, they might be people that you'll end up reaching out to, to get some more information, get more context, and get a different perspective on the projects that you're proposing. So. so this and other materials from Kate and stuff that you guys will be gathering will be under the background information page on the site. Um, if you have trouble finding it later on, come ask me. I'll be glad to point you to it. And one other thing that I think is also on your website is this Wednesday, one of the broader issues that, that a group will be tackling, and possibly more groups, is the redevelopment of the Fairmont line. It's a commuter rail line that's going right through the border between Roxbury and Dorchester. Um, so their first task force community, or one of their early task force community meetings is this Wednesday. So we know you don't have your groups yet, but if any of you are available to go, it would also be a great chance to take a look at the neighborhoods and, and take a short tour. It's this Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30 at the newly designed Croc Center, which is um, right, yeah, down. Well, you can find that just fairly easily. No, it's, it's just part of there down. Oh. Um, but it's actually right on the, the train line, but yeah, right by the Upham's Corner train stop there. Um, so that's a great time to go it's check out the neighborhood and get to meet some of the residents if you're able to get there. Pinned. It's not pinned yet, okay. so. It's so new it's not even pinned yet. Mm -hmm. okay. So we okay. so start with the people, these big directions are, are so important. You get to know these guys, you're so privileged that they, they come and <coughs> talk to us. Uh, but our first step, as Mike said, is to learn about the neighborhood and the neighborhood organizations. And so Kate, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just walking us through the materials that are on the site. Uh, because we're going to be assigning you to work in groups over the next week to learn about a particular topic, transportation, sure. economic health, and if you could just uh, yeah. show us what we've got. Could we go to the Dropbox? So yeah. we Kate does a fabulous job it's of amazing. assembling. Uh, it wasn't me, it was somebody on City Hall that helped. <laughs> you, you should take credit. Take credit. credit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hide the light under a book. We gave, <laughs> we gave someone a list and they helped us. <laughs> um, but so this is also available on your course website. We thought we'd kind of streamline your research process. They're divided by neighborhood, so you'll 
uh, I, I understand now that, that you'll be doing themes across all three of the neighborhoods, so you'll have to dig through these. So there's still a lot of work for you to do. Uh, so you'll have to. It's not too easy. Yeah. So you can um, see a lot of the documents about each neighborhood, anything from air quality to um, education to ethnicity to economic information, uh, as well as history and um, histories of the area. And then we have a whole section here that we're still finishing up that should be up tonight uh, with maps of each of the neighborhoods that also has a ton of demographic information. And um, for those, we know that GIS, or the GSD students probably know GIS, but these are GIS maps, so um, we didn't want to get the GSD students working on GIS maps all week, so we kind of did some of the legwork for you there. And these will be uploaded and finished uh, by tonight. So this link is on your course website, and and it should get, be a good start for everybody in their research. This is this is fantastic. You should also, of course, feel free to. Uh, I mean, this is an incredible assemblage of materials, uh, but you should feel free also in your investigations, and we'll, we'll more formally introduce this assignment shortly. Reach out to other materials as well. Those could be, you know, other books, literature, people. Maybe if you go to this community meeting or you attend Jason's conference, you know, feel free to draw on personal interactions. And as we move into these assignments, moving down from sort of broad scoping to refining, you're increasingly going to move from those secondary sources and those sorts of things down to that conversations, talking to people on the street, engaging very, very closely uh, with your community partners. So um, again, no reason not to start, on the other hand, those personal contacts uh, now if you have the chance. I would say that as you guys go through these projects, if there are sort of data sets or visualizations that would be very useful to you, please let us know. We're actually really interested in making more data publicly available that we might have, and uh, the best way for us to find out what's most useful is to get your direct insight. So um, please use us as a resource, any of us for that. So before we move on into the assignment portion, we've been talking a lot at you. Uh, questions? Reactions so far? Yeah. I have a question actually from a ways back when Michael was explaining the expectations for the course. So you mentioned funders. Is part of this project also identifying how to raise funds for these you know, ideas, or is that just a component that's not part of the deliverable? Last term, that was not part of the assignment. Uh, and you were told to think big and then develop a budget uh, and try to come up with a budget that would be workable within the city's parameters. This year, things are changing up a little bit. We're looking to try to make sure that there's money to implement projects. It is still a useful piece of information to know if there's a partner who would love to come and play on a particular project. So that's the way I'd like to introduce it, that it's an optional, not necessary, but certainly very interesting piece of information. If you can excite, if you could pitch your project to someone who then wants to fund it, that's a plus. I see yes. nodding heads over here. I, I think like as one of these recalibration phases later on, one of our hopes is that you would then say, okay, we've developed an idea with our community partner. It seems to make sense to us. We've run it by at the public review. We're going to have a Saturday session where you present to experts, community members, uh, other interested parties, and get a sense, does this work? But then hopefully you can take that out and say, well, maybe the thing you're developing is a, a digital tech application. Maybe you can go to Kendall Square. Maybe it turns out there's a group there working on something related. You can say, look, we're at this stage. Does it make sense? Okay, we've said that this would cost blank $1,000. And the person either goes, oh, actually, you've overestimated technology is such that I, or they laugh, you know, oh, that's so, so charming. Um, how sweet. Um, you know, so I think, you know, getting to that stage where you can sort of, since we're at a B school place, we can say, you know, ground truth it, uh, I think would be. I saw your foot go up when you said ground truth. That was pretty funny. Some sort of spontaneous, <laughs> it's sort of like a heel kick of joy. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. So I, that, does that answer your question? Yes. You know, uh, that this is not a packaged class. It really isn't. Uh, and our, but our expectation is that you will, guys will be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a requirement. And you lost a lot of Rockford components in order to have the center that doesn't have to be So uh, we have not, as new mechanics, the city has done a lot with both, but, uh, but we have not a, yet. But if that's a connection, and we have talked about, with the Uphams Corner Main Street, about Uphams Corner Health Center being one of the possible kind of extended partners. So they're... Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the one we've talked about. Uh -huh. So what were the Boston uh, disparities uh, 
Just, just from what I've heard here, I think you should probably try to get on her team. <laughs> As a word to the law. <laughs> other, other questions at this point, early on? Yeah, anything? I thought I saw a hand. Nope. All right. Uh, the assignment for the next class, if we're ready to move I on to that. It uh, it's, it's on the syllabus. Oh, yeah, yeah John. Sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a burning question. I don't want to assume that I know the answers to, to certain things at the beginning. And since we've got this group here, what, in your words, would be, why, why, what in your head and in the conventional thinking makes this area of particular importance? So I, I, it starts with the partners, actually. I, it, is the, it is the partners much more than the place. Jason is a terrific partner. DSN is a great partner. Um, and it is one of the premier um, sort of community development organizations in the country. Yeah. Um, and you can read tremendous amount of books, whole books about them. Um, the Main Street, which is adjacent to it in Eppley's Corner, uh, is a critical area of critical interest for the city of Boston for a, a wide variety of reasons. There's a lot of economic development, development going on there. Interest in sort of doing more to, to spur that. And then the Orchard Gardens Tenant Association is a real sort of uh, direct opportunity to work with a local residence, uh, the partners to find this reason. And, and to add, um, our community was the most devastated 28 years ago, where everyone kind of said, we're gone. We're backing up. You know, you might, there, there were plans to build fences around the community, to do some stuff that's unfortunately happening now in like Detroit, and New Orleans, where, you know, it was just so devastated that folks just said, you know what, we there's no hope. There's no community there. There's nobody living there. Let's just block it off and let's just forget it. So for, for the community, we've continued to organize and have continued to give power to make sure that um, the job is not done. And we, and we look upon our partners at the city and other development partners <coughs> to remind them that the job's not done. We are not fully revitalized as a community. We still have a lot more work to do. We've done some tremendous work, but there's still a lot more to do. So anytime that we've partnered with the city to think about different things in their neighborhood development division, you know, loves and hates us because you know, <laughs> we, you know, push and pull on uh, what, what we need. And we continue as a community to have the city bring other departments to, to the realm. So like the ur urban mechanics, we're, we're in this new partnership. We're maybe only three years old. And three, three years ago, it was us calling on them to come to the table because we were going after a federal application around how we can actually do education reform throughout the city. And we, we called on them to bring in some technology expertise and sit down with residents and think outside the box of, you know, if we got this money, which this December we'll know if we do get this money, um, how we can actually, you know, implement some technology features that could possibly change education outcomes for our youth in the community. So, for what, one of the things that you'll see maybe in a film is folks saying that um, this community was the most devastated. It was also a way to send a signal <coughs> to everyone out there that if you can put Dudley back on the map, then you're golden. Everything else is pretty easy compared to, you know, what some of the hurdles were to actually get Dudley Street back on the map, so. And so I'll, just one more point there, mm -hmm. to the issue of scaling, I think it is very useful because Dudley has this rich history with organizations like DSNI of, of community activism. <laughs> We're seeing that that isn't the case in a lot of other communities, and so the, the notion is that if we can use Dudley as, a, as an experimental test bed to try out some of these ideas and these, these approaches, that we can then take that and bring that to communities that don't have the same level of infrastructure or sort of social infrastructure in, in a sense, and to actually help them. So they're, hopefully this will create a context for helping a lot of other communities um, around the city. I would say around the country as well, because I mean certainly the ideas that we develop here, we would be very interested in sort of scaling to other cities. Absolutely, yeah. The grand plan here is that any policy school, any graduate school, should be able to 
find a way to work with uh, local government, community organizations, academics in a kind of a community in innovation lab. Um, so we're hoping as a pedagogical matter to develop things that are scalable and also to in the classroom have a shared knowledge of this geography. That's why we're not picking disparate uh, areas. We want everybody to learn about this place so that even if you end up working with a different a different local group, you'll know about this neighborhood. So, uh, and they have the capacity to cope with us. <laughs> you know, and that's yeah. part of it. There's a question. There's a question? Right. Yeah. I'm just curious, are we going to have an opportunity to work with any of the elected officials in the area? The local elected officials? Yeah. You can Why not? potentially bring in, yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm sure that there would be some very interesting folks. Yeah. Okay. I can imagine all kinds of things happening. But I love that attitude. To just yeah. Be, I mean, yeah. that's going to be one of the things you do over the coming weeks, yes. is sort of mapping out, you know, who is a relevant person for you to engage with? Is it elected officials? Is it other community groups, as Kate highlighted? There's other organizations active. To what extent will you engage with them? To what extent might you just hit the streets, you know? Um, in the, especially in the early stage, to just figure out what the heck's going on for you, because you know, we have a huge sort of leap that we need to make in terms of our knowledge, first of the communities, their assets and their uh, challenges, but also of this physical space, because it is so different than what most of us are experiencing. Okay, so, oh, yeah, question. Well, I don't know if we're going to have a chance to talk about this more later. I imagine we will, but I want to ask for Jason and for the city um, about maybe just before we begin this process, do you have any advice on, uh, you know, us as your partners, what um, what you'd like to see out of, out of the students uh, in terms of working with the community? That's your question. And what questions you have for us? Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine we'll talk about this more, but maybe a good time to talk about it. Yeah, so go, going through it um, last year, coming back for a second round, um, probably my, my expectations are higher. Uh, so, because um, when you do things first, you kind of test and see, test and see. Now we actually know what we want, so we will, we will push each and every one of you to think differently. We will, as as what Susan said, um, you know, all, all of you are walking into this community as guests. Um, some folks can walk into a community uh, as a guest, and other folks can actually walk into a community thinking that they're an expert. I would say to all of you now, you all are guests in my community. Please do not walk into my community as experts. You will actually disrespect residents, you will disrespect the partnership. So that's one important thing. Um, one of the big things that, that I always love to push folks on is their creativity. Please do not think that anything is out of bounds. The only thing that is out of bounds might be the checkbook, but we'll figure that out. <laughs> so please come up with you know crazy ideas, wacky ideas, something that you may have seen on TV, like, damn, that could work. <laughs> because we're actually implementing one of those things right now that folks thought was crazy from last year, but it's actually being implemented you know, as we speak. So please come with your A game, because that's what we're going to expect, and that's what we're going to push you. We're, we're, we're not going to accept an, an easy technology product or something that you may say, oh, well, this is actually a blueberry now. It's not a blackberry. <laughs> No, no, no. There's no repackaging. There's no <laughs> come up with some with, with some really out of the box ideas. So, something that will make me, because I'm a huge technology geek, be like, wow. All right, <laughs> now we're talking. So, so that's why I'm expecting from everyone is one, you know, be humble coming into this community uh, because the community's gone through a lot and the community's gone through some partnerships and have dealt with other universities and other students and other students that have come in, you know, they're not humble. They come in as experts trying to tell people what they want, <coughs> what they need. And actually the residents are very keen on what they want and what they need. They just need somebody to, you know, bounce ideas off of and come up with some creative solutions. So so that's what my perspective is from the I would, I would note, sorry, I think 
the reason you guys all went to design school and public policy school is to take on sort of the biggest challenges that we face in this, in this world today, to, to close the achievement gap or to reduce health, reduce health disparities or to improve the quality of housing in our, in our cities. And if the answers to any of those things were easy or known, they would have been done. And the whole intent of this effort is to actually think creatively and originally and come up with stuff that really is, seems perhaps up in the beginning slightly off the wall because the solutions are going to come from doing real innovative experiments, not sort of clever repurposing of existing ideas that haven't really come through in other places. Yeah. Um, so given, given last, uh, last year's efforts, in what capacity will we be introduced to those, those projects, the projects that are being pursued, yeah. so that you know, I'm trying to not repeat a lot of the same Oh, upon, interesting. Uh, upon, we were thinking of uh, bringing Kate in a little later to talk about how, how things are being implemented. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, do that early. I don't think there's any chance you're going to replicate that. <laughs> 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 and you know, this is, this is Carol Bloom talks about this, the anxiety influence. You know, no influence. You just start. You just start. Yeah. We I will talk to you eventually about Kate's experience of what, what happened. Yeah. But I don't think there's any chance you're going to replicate now. Nah. <laughs> you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it was pretty fun last year, um, and this year too. Okay, other questions, and then we'll go on to the assignment. No, no, no. Okay, so Mike, we're going sure. to do this. Um, so we move from the people to the neighborhood, yeah. and what we've done is pick nine topic areas for research. <coughs> Again, starting with the with the material for cover site, but using your imagination and smarts. And uh, there are a lot of you today who rejoice in that. But it's, and we don't quite know exactly who's in the class yet. So what we're going to do is count off by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And remember your number. <laughs> Please That's remember your, your number. Task. Remember your number. And then um, we'll be forming groups. OK? It's all pretty simple. Uh, and then but the goal here is to, uh, you're going to come up with a 10-minute presentation that you're going to give next week. Right? So that's the point. And that presentation should take the form of something that can be emailed to Diane before the class so we can all watch it. This was very effective last year. Um, a lot of things that people didn't figure out, didn't get right. Uh, you know, we helped each other correct what we had learned. Uh, and we got a lot of collective learning from uh, everything that happened. So it's a great way to start, I think. We'll find out how it goes this year. Uh, so there's the assignments. Um, you're going to have to do a little group coordination, not easy. Uh, so what we're going to do first is count off by nines. I'm going to remind you that there's a tour of the neighborhood next Friday, which is mandatory. Got to do it. Diane will be sending out information about how we do that mm -hmm. from 6 p.m. And there's a movie about the neighborhood, which we'll also see uh, after the tour. Okay. Quick, yeah. quick question. Yeah. Purple, purple, purple uh, lawyer. More subtle color than that. More subtle <laughs> color. Yes. Did you say you watch the presentation? No, you're going to need to email the presentation to Diane in advance of the class, and then we will all look at it. So it's a written assignment. Yeah, it could be a PowerPoint. Could be a film. You know, be creative. Whatever you want to do. Could be an animated GIF. Interpret it. Interpret it. But we, it should be something that we can all see. Okay? Finger puppets. Yeah. All right, they're not smiling. So um, <laughs> we're going to count off. Oh, uh, the question you asked is just a quick question. So the tour of the neighborhood that's integrated with Jason's thing here? Or is it different? Uh, that's different. That's a different tour. That's different. different. Yeah, the tour is on Friday. Jason's conference is on Wednesday. Next tour is not this Friday, but the Friday after. It's on the syllabus. Oh, it's next Friday. Yeah. Right. It's not this Twice Friday. Friday. It's next Friday. Mm -hmm. Thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. So we really worked hard on the syllabus. We tried to make it as, as clear as possible, but it's always possible to screw it up. Uh, but we're very responsive. I think it's one of our strengths. Um, and Laura was in the class last year. Uh, we, we pivoted several times. <laughs> and, uh, it, it worked. It worked. The pivoting is, is good. All right. So what, what we're going to do is count off, and then you'll be abuzz with this excitement about your number. We'll assign the number to the nine topics. And then we're going to take a break as you find your people and coordinate towards being able to give a presentation next week. Okay, not easy. Uh, and then I think we'll, uh, Marshall will be here and we'll do the second part of the class after that. All right? All right, so you're number one. Number one. I'm auditing, so I'm going to plug in somewhere. Okay, two. <laughs> Say it out loud. So we can see. Yeah. Three. Four. You can do it, Michael. Uh, five. <laughs> <laughs> Six. Eight, nine. One, two, three, four. I'm going to Five. Okay. 
is economics, two is housing, education. See, we've got them all in order there. So remembering your number in your head, find the ship's object. Uh, and now we're just going to say, okay, organize yourselves. <laughs> we'll give you a few minutes. Give you a few minutes.
It's not your fault. It's your So, um, all right. How many of you ever done community work? All right, that's good. Speak up, louder. No, all right. All right. Well, let, actually, let me back up for a minute. First, who's here from outside the United States? All right, where? Uh, originally from the UK, but then I've been living in London for the last four years. Oh, good. He's full of spot. Yeah. Well, within the U.S., uh, how about from the West? Where? California. San Francisco, California. Where in California? Uh, Southern California, the desert. On the Mojave Desert? Yeah. Uh, Barstow, someplace like that? In between Barstow and Riverdale. Uh, Boron? No. Called Hellendale. Hellendale. Oh, no. Famous spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, where else? In the West? California. Uh, where? Uh, Hermosa Beach. All right. How about else from the West? The West broadly understood. How about the Southwest? Compton? 
Conference the West. <laughs> Southwest LA. Yeah. LA, Compton. Um, how about the South? Where? The West. Yeah. North. Yeah. Florida. Florida. Houston, Texas. Houston, all right. And the Midwest? Wait, so we got the West wow. and the South. <laughs> and Singapore, no. <laughs> the West and the South. All right, how about the uh, Middle Atlantic states? That's like New York, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Delaware. Delaware. New York City. Yeah. New York City. Yeah. New York City. All right. New England? Yeah, where? Yeah. Grew up in Portland, Maine. Yeah. Newton, Massachusetts. Newton. Boston. Boston. New Hampshire. All right. Keep going. Uh, where did I miss? Um, is that about it? So why am I asking that? Why do I want to know that? Why do I want to know that? Yeah. You're asking about our community of origin. And why, why is that relevant information? Because it shapes some of our ideas and how we approach issues. Yeah, very much. And why else? Why else do you think I started with that? <laughs> Cultural differences in terms of communication. Yeah, that's good. And why else? Why else? You want us to feel part of this group. Oh, OK. There's an <laughs> inclusion exercise. Why else? <laughs> Well, from your class, one of your first questions is, uh, who are your people? Yeah. <laughs> so I know whose people, people, who, whose people, people are. <laughs> no, I, all these reasons. And, and, but also because I wanted, I think I wanted to underscore the fact that you have a lot of resources here to draw uh, in terms of dealing with different kinds of communities, different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of settings. And I think, the first thing to be clear about is that communities, you know, are not monolithic. And they're diverse, and they're diverse within themselves. They're not uh, easily stereotyped. Uh, and uh, the, the range of experience that's here ought to be very helpful. Because it's very helpful finding yourself in a particular context to be able to compare notes with others. And then reflect back on your own context and sort of where you come from. It's a whole learning challenge uh, in, in my experience. Um, and my experience, uh, just briefly, was has ma mainly been after uh, dropping out after my junior year here at Harvard College, was in the Civil Rights Movement first. It was uh, I grew up in California, Bakersfield, California. That's why I'm curious. About, that's how I knew about the desert. Yeah, uh, and uh, I came here as an undergraduate, and then uh, left to work in the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi for two years uh, uh, during Freedom Summer, which was my first real experience out, in a sense, out of the well. Really, my first experience in a community other than my own was coming from Bakersfield to Harvard. Actually, that was the first very shocking experience because uh, it was a big shift uh, coming from uh, an oil and agriculture town in California with a small Jewish community. My father's a rabbi there uh, to Harvard, which if you think it's elitist now, you should have seen it then. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the geezer parade. You know the geezer parade? The geezer parade is that at commencement, they have the procession of classes. And, you know, uh, like starting with the class of Aught 5 or whatever it is, whoever's around. And it's a little bit like these uh, you know, little white guys. It's like the, the human evolution charts. <laughs> <laughs> they gradually, little more like this. And then there's a few women and then more women and then a few spots of color and then it changes to what it is now. So it, it was quite a different a different spot. A pretty, both exciting and intimidating place to come. Um, so after here that I went to Mississippi, which was yet another uh, encounter, worked there for a couple of years, went back to California where I'd grown up, and Cesar Chavez had just started an uh, uh, organization of uh, mostly Mexican immigrant farm workers uh, organizing the union. Now in that case, I'd grown up in the middle of that community, but I'd never seen it. Uh, I had to come to, uh, well, I really had to go to Mississippi to get educated about race, power, and politics in America to go back home and see a, a community of people of color uh, who have no political rights, uh, very few economic rights and discovered that California had its own rich history of, of racial segregation going back to the turn of the century of the Chinese. Uh, and that as late as the 50s, we were desegregating movie theaters that had Mexicans upstairs and whites downstairs. And so um, 
I learned that Mississippi was really not an exception to America, but an example of America that we needed to change. And I found it right home, right where I'd grown up, but hadn't seen. So I did that for the next 16 years, up until 1981, working as organizing, and then another 10 years of union nation electoral work, mostly in California. Then was invited to my reunion here, my 25th reunion, even though I hadn't graduated. Uh, while here, I got the idea of coming back to finish my senior year, which I did in 1991. Uh, and then graduated class of 64 92. <laughs> uh, the history of government, did the Masters in Kennedy School, PhD in sociology, and then was asked to teach organizing, which for me was a way to integrate my life experience, social science, in a conversation with a rising generation. So that, in sum, is sort of my succession of journeys through many communities, not my own, and even discovering that communities I thought were my own were very different than what I had found them to be. Uh, and in the course of that, I found a calling that was going to serve me for about 28 years of organizing. Uh, and organizing for me meant um, not doing for people, but working with people. Uh, and um, it meant understanding that when there was enormous inequality, it usually wasn't because people wanted it that way, but because some people were benefiting from it and others were losing. And when those who were, who were losing would try to change it, they'd get resistance from those that are benefiting. And so for me, the central question, power, became a very central concern and interest, first in the South, then with the farm workers, then in politics, and so forth. But I also learned early on that unless, unless the people who were at the bottom end of things were also a part of the solution, that then it wouldn't be real. In other words, it was important that people become authors of the change in their lives. And, and that's a real important thing in organizing. Organizing distinguishes between uh, serving clients, like providing services to clients, or marketing to customers, like selling ideas, to developing constituencies. And constituency comes from the, from the, the, the Latin constare, which means to stand together. So what organizers try to do is work with people so they can stand together, assert their common interests, and mobilize their resources on behalf of those interests. Now, when, when, when the problems that you're trying to address are the result of power inequalities from which flow all these other inequalities, and we can talk more about that if, 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 if you wish, um, you have a sort of conundrum because the problem is power inequality, and then you want to try to shift the power somehow, but wait a second, they don't have any power, so what do you do? The breakthrough for me was learning that there's a difference between resources and power. Um, and that's what we learned in organizing, that, that while many communities are lacking in power or they're suffering from power inequality, they're not, they're not lacking in resources, in all resources. And the challenge of the organizer who wants to work with the community to support its changing of its circumstances, the challenge is to figure out how to enable them to translate their resources into a source of power. So it's not like starting with what do people not have, but rather starting with what they do have. It's a different way of thinking about working with the community, starting not with deficit, but with asset, recognizing the inequalities that are there. The clearest example that, the example that always stayed with me was that of the Montgomery bus boycott that started the modern civil rights movement, uh, which was uh, 1955. I'm gonna get a little history here. Um, you know, Supreme Court ruled the year before segregation was unconstitutional. 1955, the people in Montgomery, Alabama, took a look at their buses. And the way the buses worked, there were uh, blacks in the back, whites in the front, no man's land in the middle, an armed deputized bus driver at the front. So if you were a black person, you were going to go to work. You got to go on, you had to walk past the bus driver, the armed bus driver, walk past the rows of white people, find a place to sit. But then, of course, if a white person came along and needed a seat, then you were expected to give up and give your seat. Twice a day, to work home. How to make you feel? pretty outrageous. Went on for years and years and years. The Supreme Court decision gave people the idea that maybe they could use the court to change the law so they found <coughs> somebody to test that system and recruited her to not get up when she was told to. And of course, you know who I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about? Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Now, Rosa Parks was not a lady who one day just got tired. <laughs> uh, she was secretary of the NAACP chapter. She'd been trained in organizing at Highlander School. Uh, and it was all part of a strategy to try to bring the court, to bring the court into the picture and use federal power on state and local power 
which is one reason the South doesn't like the federal government very much, because it was a mechanism of integration, uh, fundamentally, in order to try to change that practice and integrate the buses. But while they were doing this, the Women's Committee at the college said, well, wait a second, this is going to take forever. And I don't know, you know, the Supreme Court ruled the year before and nothing much was happening. So maybe we need to show our solidarity with Rosa by all staying off the buses the next day. So that's where the idea came from of looking for power in a different place. And instead of looking for power up, they began to look for power where? And where else? What's the opposite of up? What do you see when you look down? You see your feet. They discovered that since everybody had feet, they in fact had a resource from which they could build power. If they used their feet, instead of using them to get on the bus and give bus fare to the bus company, they used their feet to walk to work and stay off the bus and deny the bus company their bus fare, that individual resource became a source of collective and that's sort of the magic of organizing. And that's what happened. And it took a year, and they succeeded. And the significant thing is that when they succeeded, they not only integrated the buses, but they built a powerful community because the community owned that victory. It wasn't anything that had been given. It was something they had earned. It was something they had built. And it was something that they now looked at one another and said, wow, look what we can do. Let's go on now to drinking fountains, schools, and you know all the rest of it. Now, I, I, I tell that story just because for me it was a sort of fundamental insight into what the way of approaching community work that has been my way since then, which is to first look at the power deficit, second, look at the resources that a community has, and then third, figure out how to work with that community so that collectively they can use their resources to rebalance things so they can be authors of the change they need. Does that make sense? So it's about for me, it's about developing leadership, building community around leadership, and building power with the community. And after learning this in the South, these were the lessons I learned as well with the, with the farm workers, and really in, in this years of, 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 of organizing work that I've done and, uh, and now teach. And it's a question of thinking about like how you look at a community and what you see your role there to be. And what expectations you have of it, and what kinds of expectations people have of you. Now, I want to open this up right now to your concerns, but before I just want to say one thing, that the history of, of social change and of, of social movements is not a history of all insiders just doing their thing, and it's certainly not a history of all outsiders just doing their thing. It's rather been a combination. In my understanding, the first organizer, at least the first organizer I've always thought of as being the first organizer, was Moses, a guy named Moses, who was of the oppressed, but raised in the house of the oppressor. Uh, confusing. Uh, experienced the urgency of a need for change, but also being raised in the house of the oppressor saw the possibility of things being different. And it was confused. He had to go to the desert to sort of sort it out. You know, which is where in the Bible you go to sort things out. Uh, and eventually came back uh, as this sort of organizer figure. And the reason I mention that is that if you run through Dr. Martin Luther King, for example, was he an insider or an outsider to Montgomery? Well, he's African American. He's a PhD from Boston University, sort of a member of the black church aristocracy, his father and grandfather's big black church in Atlanta. Was he an insider or an outsider to the person working on a plantation? It's complicated. And, and so the reason I mention that is that sometimes people on the inside think that they, they got all the answers. And sometimes people on the outside, especially if they come from Harvard, think they have all the answers. And, uh, and, and nobody does. And the reality is that it's through a collaboration that need and possibility can be played out. And that's the exciting thing about the opportunity you have is to experience that and be part of that and contribute to that uh, in, a, in a powerful way if you get it right. So let me just stop there for a second. And, and what are your concerns? And you're all from communities. You've heard some about these projects. You've done work in communities, not your own. So 
What are your concerns? Yeah. Really being able to understand and explore the community's concerns. As an outsider, how do you break down the barriers between you and the community to understand what really is bothering them, rather than what you think the answer is going to be? <coughs> I wonder if somebody would mind writing some of these. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks. How to actually understand what's on oh, the community's mind, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a little challenging because who is the community? I mean, is the first person you see in a bus station or at a bus stop or in some way the community is a city council member elected by that area, the community, is a church leader of the community. So, I mean, the first, in a way, the first challenge is to sort of, well, wait a second, who is the community? Your question is exactly the right question. In organizing, we start with the question, who are my people? We don't start with the question, what is my problem? But who are my people? How do the people who are my people experience the problem? How do I experience it? How do they experience it? And then how can I work with them so they can mobilize their resources to deal with the problem? So it's sort of like from people to problem to solution. Or in the class I teach, people power change, people change power. But it's kind of the same idea. But first, your question is right on because the first question is, how do I understand who the people are? I want to come back to who? Who are the people? What's on their minds? What else? What other concerns? Yeah. How can I win the trust of the community that they'll believe I'm on their side or that we're on their side? Okay.